The leaders of the world may have the loudest voices, but they don't always say the right things. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and this is about the Milgram experiment. Now, a lot of you guys know that I love to do true crime videos and talk about that kind of stuff because of the psychology behind the killers, what makes them who they are, what makes them kill. And this experiment has a lot to do with how humans think and why we do the things we do. And so when I came across this, I knew that I wanted to share it with those of you who love true crime for the reasons that I do as well. Now you'll have to let me know down below if you want me to continue with sharing experiments with you. I find them really interesting, but I'd like to know what you guys think as well. But the results of this one are definitely scary. By the way, if you enjoy my content, please make sure that you are subscribed and liking and commenting just to let me know that I'm not crazy talking about this stuff to myself, that you guys actually enjoy it as well. Now let's get back to the story. So these experiments started around 1961 by a Yale University psychologist named Stanley Milgram. He wanted to basically test the, the conflict between obedience to authority and personal conscience. So essentially how far you would go to do what you were told even though you knew it was wrong. They began in July in the Lindsley Chittenden Hall at Yale University with 40 male participants who had been chosen from a newspaper ad. It said that it was a study for the university to test learning and memory and that if they were chosen they would be paid $4.50 an hour. They said that they wanted men from the ages of 20 to 50 who weren't students but had jobs such as factory workers, city employees, laborers, barbers, businessmen, clerks, professionals, telephone workers, construction workers, salespeople, and white collar workers, but no special requirements were needed. They just wanted regular people. And after they selected their 40, the experiments began. In each session, they had three people in the room. One was the experimenter who was conducting the entire experiment and was basically in charge of the whole thing. The next was the volunteer from the newspaper that was called the teacher because they believed that they were just assisting and not actually the main subject at the time. And that was because an actor was pretending to be another subject and pretending to be the one that they were testing at the time and they were called the learner. So once again, these men being tested who came from the newspaper had no idea that it was all rigged and that they were actually the ones being tested even though they were testing these volunteers that were actually the actors. So the subject and the actor went in at the same time to meet with the experimenter. And the experimenter would explain to them that the whole thing was about memorizing and learning and seeing the effect that punishment had on memorizing content. Then the subjects and the actor would draw slips of paper to determine who was the teacher and who was the learner, except for that was rigged as well, and they both said teacher, and when the actual subject took one and he of course read teacher, the other one just automatically read learner and handed the paper back to the experimenter. They were then all transferred to a different room where the actor was strapped into a chair that kind of looked like an electrical chair so that they couldn't move. This is when the actual subject was then taken to another room where they couldn't see the actor. The real subject was then shown the electrical shock generator which had 30 switches. These were increments of voltage from 15 to 450. It was labeled moderate, strong, danger, severe shock, and then the final two were labeled XXX. Now once again, the real subject was unable to see the actor, but then they were instructed to teach the actor in the other room word pairs. They began by reading the word pairs to the actor and then after that, they would go on to just saying one word in the word pair and the actor was to say the right word back that paired with that word. And so the real subject would tell the actor one of the words and then give four choices of multiple choice answers that they could choose from. If they chose the wrong pairing, they were to be shocked. With each wrong answer, the subject was told to go up an increment in voltage. And at some point when it got so high with more and more wrong answers, the actor 
would begin to plead to get out and that he had a heart condition and that he wasn't doing well and that he wanted out over and over and over again. By this point, some of these subjects would turn to the experimenter and ask them if they should continue or just kind of look at them to see what they should do, but the experimenters had very calculated responses. They would say things like, please continue. The experiment requires that you continue or it is absolutely essential that you continue and you have no other choice, you must go on. But some subjects didn't even ask the experimenter until they were up to the 300 voltage mark where then the actor in the other room began to bang on the walls demanding to be released. If the subjects asked, the experimenter would still say to continue and if they did, once they reached the highest levels of voltage, the actor would refuse to say anything, refuse to answer any questions, and that's when the subjects would look at the experimenter again as to what to do because the subject that they thought was the subject that was actually the actor wasn't answering. And the experimenter would tell them to continue because no answer is a wrong answer and they were to be shocked again. Some of the subjects would ask if there was going to be permanent damage to the person being shocked, the one who was screaming in the other room, and the experimenter had an answer for that as well. They would say, although the shocks may be painful, there is no permanent tissue damage, so please go on. And if the subjects would say to the experimenter that the person clearly wanted to stop and they needed to stop, the experimenter would say, whether the learner likes it or not, you must go on until he has learned all the word pairs correctly so please go on. The only way the experiments were to stop is if the actor got all of the word pairings correct, or if the subject had still not wanted to continue after four times of the experimenter telling them that they needed to, or if it went so far that the subject shocked the actor three times with the highest voltage, then they would stop as well. And when the experiments were over, the results were shocking. They had wanted to see the level of shock a participant would be willing to deliver when told to. And before the whole experiments, they had asked Yale University students what they thought the experiment outcome was going to be. They asked them how many out of 100 do they think would deliver the maximum shock? And they said three but the real results of the experiment was 65% of participants. That meant 26 out of 40 people delivered the maximum shock. And the remaining 14 stopped before giving the maximum, but they did deliver up to 300 voltage. But all of the participants became distraught, agitated, and angry with the experimenter after having to follow these orders and hearing the actor screaming, and three of them even had seizures. But what they didn't know until after was that thankfully the shocks weren't real. When the actor and the real subject were separated, the actor would set up a tape recorder that had sounds of shocks that would play at the different increments of voltage, and they would scream along with it to make it more more realistic. They would pretend to be in even more pain as the time went on, and even though they weren't really being hurt, these subjects thought that they were and thought that they were inflicting the pain, and you could see the amount of stress that they were going through. They were sweating, trembling, stuttering, biting their lips, groaning, digging fingernails into their skin, and nervous laughing. But every single participant at least one time stopped to question what they were doing. But unfortunately, most continued after the experimenter talked them into it. But even after, 84% of the participants said that they were glad to have done it and only 1% regretted it. But the truth about why Stanley Milgram created these experiments was much darker than what they originally thought. You see, this was a year after the trial of Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the major organizers of the Holocaust under Adolf Hitler's power. He was in charge of transporting millions of humans to extermination camps. And five years after Hitler committed suicide, he was found in Argentina and found guilty of war crimes and executed in 1962. And Stanley Milgram wanted to know if possibly Adolf Eichmann and his accomplices were just following orders. 
and whether Germans were particularly obedient to authority figures, as the common explanation for killings in World War II had explained. He said that his experiments showed him that the physical presence of an authority figure increased compliance dramatically, and that since Yale was a trusted institution, it made them feel safe. And then when the experimenter came in, they felt that it was a competent expert, and so they went along with it. He said, ordinary people simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Moreover, even when the destructive effects of their work become patently clear, they are asked to carry out actions incompatible with fundamental standards of morality. Relatively few people have the resources needed to resist authority. He believed that people had two states of behavior in a social situation, one being the autonomous state, which is when people take direct responsibility for their actions and the repercussions that come after, or the agentic state, which is where they are okay with taking orders because they know the responsibility will fall back on the person giving the orders and they won't have to take responsibility for it. Or in other words, they act as agents for another person's will. He says to have people be in the latter, then there must be a person in charge that is looked at as qualified to be in charge. And the person being ordered must believe that that person in charge will take responsibility in the end for what they're doing. Different variations of the Milgram experiments were tested and one being how clothes affect it. If one person was wearing a lab coat and was called out of the office, he was the one who was needed to answer that phone call and came back versus a person just in regular clothes that wasn't called out if the obedience levels would be different, and they were. The obedience dropped 20% with the person in regular clothing. At one point, the testing was transferred to rundown offices versus the fancy university, and the obedience levels dropped 47.5%. Experiments done on just women showed no differences in obedience, but higher stress levels. 10 years earlier than all of this, in 1951, experiments had been done to test social pressure in general. It was the ASH experiment, where eight people would go into a room and sit at a table, although one of them was the subject and seven of them were actors. The experimenter would say that it was a study to test visual judgments, and then they would place two cards out on the table. One card would have one line, and the other card would have three different lines. The experimenter would go around to each person and ask them what line on the card with three lines matched the line on the card with one line. This was done several different times, and eventually the actors in the room started choosing wrong answers, and they would all choose the wrong answer. And so then that one person that wasn't the actor was tested to see if they would go along with the group or if they would choose the correct answer. The results concluded that 32% of the time they would go along with it. 75% conformed one time and 25% never did. Participants were questioned after as to why they chose that answer and they said that they knew that it was the wrong answer and they had the right answer, but they were worried about looking foolish or peculiar if they said a different answer than everybody else. Their final conclusion was that people conform for two reasons, one being that they either want to fit in or two being that they believe the other people are more informed than they are, which I believe is a great conclusion to the Milgram experiment as well. In the early 2000s, the Milgram experiment was done on a French game show, it was replicated again, but this time the level of obedience to this game show host was 81% and in 1961, it was only 65. But as far as this making somebody an innocent person when they do bad things, I don't think that I agree with that. Um, I think that the whole idea of them being under some sort of psychological abuse or deception with under Hitler's power and all of that seeing if they're just accomplices, I'm I don't know. I don't know enough about all of this and I don't think anybody does because these experiments still aren't foolproof. I do think that it's quite interesting because no, they're not necessarily innocent. They are doing these things, they are doing these bad things, but these experiments kind of showed what you can do to a person when they think that you have more power or they just don't know enough and they think that you know better. 
I wonder if it could almost be seen as a form of Stockholm syndrome, which is where you get, you form a psychological alliance with your captor as a hostage and begin to go along with them and, you know, love them, do what they want you to do. And it's not even like a bad thing anymore. You just, that's how you think your life is. I wonder if that could be a form of it in the long run when looked into more. And in their cases, it wouldn't even be the captivity or physical abuse or kidnapping was needed to get that Stockholm syndrome. It's just that these leaders make them believe that it's a survival thing, that if they don't kill these certain people, they'll die. And I could totally see how that could enforce a person to do bad things. But then again, does that make them a bad person as well? You guys leave me some comments down below. Again, don't be nasty towards me. I don't really have an opinion on this one. I think that there are a lot of things that still need to be looked into and I highly disagree with them being completely innocent. So I just think it's interesting how you can mess with a person's mind just by how things are presented and just the amount of obedience that we can give to someone unknowingly because we believe they know best is terrifying. But what did you guys think about this? I thought it was one of the creepiest things I've ever read about. I love experiments and this wasn't a, you know, super dark, like they were being tortured in any way type experiment, but I thought it was even scarier because that's the thing. They had no idea that they were basically being told exactly what to do. And if, and if they really were inflicting pain on these people, they were doing that because somebody was telling them to. And yes, there were, I watched a film about it and there were a lot that questioned it over and over and over again. And some that even said, you know, I'm not going, I'm not going any further with this. I can hear them screaming, no. But that would take a lot of psychological strength to break through that, oh, they're telling me what to do, I need to do it, and say, no, this is ethically, morally wrong. And I think that we all would like to say that we would be the ones who would be like, oh my gosh, no, like I'm not gonna hurt this person, I can hear them screaming, but I wonder if in that situation it would change and if any of us would do the wrong thing just because of the pressure socially that we feel that we have to do it. I don't know, it's interesting, it's something to ponder and to leave a comment down below which you think, if you think you'd be able to tell them no right off the bat or if you think that you would honestly be one to just go along with it. Like I said, I would love to be the one that would say, heck no, you are hurting somebody, I'm not going along with this, but who knows what would happen once you got in that situation, especially if it was a more life or death situation. So yeah, if you want me to do more experiments like this, please let me know. I would love to and remember to subscribe and just so I don't feel like a crazy person, thumbs up these videos. And yeah, don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. Can we help being a follower or is it ingrained in us?